So I welcome all and I would request uh, Kusum to formally start. Thank you. Yeah. Hello and welcome to everyone uh, to our in conversation and a warm welcome, special one to our special guest, Professor Lynn Inns. Uh, I'm Kusum Pant Joshi, social historian and chief researcher at the South Asian Cinema Foundation or SACF. Uh, this was started in the year 2000 and SACF is London's first South Asian organization that has consistently worked uh, with community and mainstream film, cultural and educational organizations to promote film education and research and to build cultural bridges between diverse communities. Our partners include the British Film Institute for the BFI, the Nehru Center and the University of Westminster. Today is the first public event of our heritage project titled Selective Inclusion, African and Asian Celebrities in London's Vanity Fair magazine, 1868 to 1914. This project is funded by UK's Heritage Lottery Fund. SSEF has been working with our project volunteers during the last 12 months. We have identified, located and collected Vanity Fair caricatures, information, biographies and books from diverse sources. Our focus has been on 28 celebrities from India, Africa, China, Japan, Korea, Thailand, and Malaysia, who we find were featured in Vanity Fair during the period of our study. Today, Vanity Fair is an American monthly periodical of popular culture, fashion, and current affairs. But in the period of our study, that is 1868 to 9, uh, 1914, it was a British magazine brought out from London. Started in 1868, its founder and editor right up to 1898 was Thomas Gibson Bowles. Published in quarter dimension, quite a large size, that is about 37 and a half centimeters by 24 centimeters, with about eight to 10 pages per issue, Vanity Fair had a distinct identity. Its aim was to expose the vanities of Victorian society. Bowles wrote extensively for his magazine Two other important contributors among several others were well-known names such as P.G. Woodhouse and Lewis Carroll. Carroll was known for his Alice in Wonderland and uh, such uh, and other works, uh, other works, but he, he contributed word puzzles to Vanity Fair, which became extremely popular. Vanity Fair's first edition covered the week's social and political events and had theater and literary reviews. At first it struggled and had to compete with its rivals. But in 1869, Bowles took a novel step. He published a full page caricature of the British Prime Minister, Benjamin Disraeli. This was the first of over 2,300 caricatures that were published in the Vanity Fair every week up to the year 1914. Vanity Fair's distinctive color lithographs of celebrities from diverse parts of the world and the insights and humorous biographies that appeared with them led to a spurt in public demand for Vanity Fair. The caricatures became so popular that they were printed, sold, bought and framed and used as decorative pieces in people's homes. Some even traveled long distances. In a book called Temples and Elephants by Karl Bock, a European visitor who came and stayed for some time in Thailand. He writes in his book that was published in 1898 that in the dining room of the palace of the King of Siam, I noticed a number of framed cartoons from Vanity Fair, conspicuous among them being the portrait of the Chromata. Now the Chromata was one of the ambassadors from Siam who had visited the UK in the late 19th century. Leslie Matthew Ward, perhaps the most distinguished illustrator or caricaturist in the Vanity Fair had prophesied in the 19th century that when the history of the Victorian era comes to be written in true perspective, the most faithful mirror and record of the spirit of the times will be sought and found in Vanity Fair. It is in this faithful mirror that our heritage project we are trying to use to highlight 28 prominent non-Europeans from Asia and Africa who were featured in the magazine. Apparently their inclusion was because of their perceived political importance and socioeconomic st status. The first on our list of 28 celebrities is Nawab Mansur Ali Khan. 
Arriving in England in 1869, he stayed on until 1880. He was featured in the Vanity Fair on the 16th of April, 1870. Our guest, Lynn Inns, will focus on her ancestor, the Nawab. But first, I would request John Eade, our chairperson, to introduce Professor Lynn Inns. Let me say a few words about John. John Eade is Professor of Sociology and Anthropology at the University of Roehampton and visiting professor at Toronto University. After research on Bengali Muslim middle class identity in Calcutta, he focused on Bangladeshi identity politics in Tower Hamlets and the changing nature of global migration to London more generally. He has also written on pilgrimage and is a co-editor of two books, book two book series on pilgrimage, religion, space and place. He will be working soon with colleagues in Germany and Italy on a study of COVID, minorities and state engagement funded by the Volkswagen Steif II. John E, please. Hi everyone, can you hear me? Yes. Good. Okay, um, well, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce um, Lynn, Professor Lynn Inns. Um, and as we'll, as we'll find out, she has a, a fascinating um, life uh, of uh, moving around between different places, um, working across various disciplines, um, and fascinatingly linked to the uh, project that uh, Kusum has just uh, um, introduced. So um, I just want to say very briefly um, a word about uh, Lynn. Uh, she's Emeritus Professor of Postcolonial Literatures at the University of Kent, Canterbury. Um, she, she was uh, educated in Australia, uh, but then moved to North America uh, where she taught in Alabama, and she became uh, fascinated uh, in a key theme of her work, which is cultural nationalism, um, through uh, various um, literatures. And she completed her, um, her PhD at Cornell. Um, and then she taught at um, uh, Amherst in Massachusetts, uh, where she uh, um, met the very famous Nigerian novelist uh, Chinua Achebe. So she clearly works between uh, academic and um, uh, literary production. Um, in other words, she's just not just an academic, if you like. Um, anyway, she's been in England since 1975, uh, based at Kent, but also she's been involved in a professional um, um, association for teaching of African, Asian and Caribbean literatures, uh, as well as being on the board of the journal um, Wasa Theory. Um, I, I won't list all her publications uh, because I think everyone has received her um, bio. Um, but what, what, what's so nice, and I can relate to this because I'm at a similar stage in my uh, life, I suppose, is that she's keeping going. And uh, she's researching and writing about her great grandfather, hence why she's here today. Uh, but also she's um, writing about her own, um, her, her own life in a way. So this is not just about um, her great, uh, her ancestor, but it's also about her own life and her own linkage to, to the past, so past and present linked very nicely. Um, so I'll hand over to Lynn and I'm looking forward very much to, to the whole session. And my job will really be to look after the chat box. So please use the chat box and I will monitor it and come in later on um, drawing together the various questions that have been raised in the chat box or comments. Thank you very much. Hello, uh, my name is Lalit Mohan Joshi. I'm the director of South Asian Cinema Foundation. I've been a film historian and a documentary filmmaker. So that's my introduction. And I would now start with my conversation and uh, tell you all that uh, how uh, Lynn happened to our project. So before I uh, uh, 
uh, start that, I would like to thank all of you, uh, the friends of uh, Lynn and uh, her academic colleagues, and uh, especially people from India, Pakistan, USA, London, and all over UK. And I especially welcome Haider Mirza from uh, Karachi, who is with us and who happens to be a close uh, relative of uh, Lynn Haynes. And we will try to uh, talk to him uh, in the midst of the conversation. So uh, how we found Lynn Haynes is a fascinating story. It shows how modern technology can help find people instantly. In the midst of COVID, the links we make through mere clicks of our fingers seem to have definitely multiplied. Early this year, Kusum was researching on the activities in London of Nawab Mansur Ali Khan, the Nizam of Bengal, Bihar, and Odisha. He was the first on our list, as said by Kusum, of African and Asian celebrities. Just by chance, she came across a newsletter of the Liver Hume Trust, dated September 2016. Its main article was on Satyajit Ray, the Indian iconic filmmaker. But it also had another article titled, The Nawab of Bengal's English Family by Lynn Inns. At the end of it was a footnote that said that the author Lynn Inns was emeritus professor at the Kent University. That's how we traced Lynn's location found her on the Facebook, talked to her on phone, and finally met her face-to-face -face at the BFI, British Film Institute, South Bank, this year early. During our working when you go lunch, we told her all about our Vanity Fair Heritage Project. The rest, as they say, is history. So before I start, let me share screen for a very quick PowerPoint. So, as uh, told by Kusum, this is a uh, project, Selective Inclusion, African and Asian Celebrities in London's Vanity Fair. Vanity Fair was a magazine, uh, <laughs> 1868 to 1914. And uh, Professor Lin Inns, descendant of Nawab Mansur Ali Khan of Bengal, will be chatting with me. And this project is supported by Heritage Lottery Fund that you can see on the screen. And of course, it is South Asian Cinema Foundation show. This is the list of 28 African and Asian celebrities. It's very, very small print, but you can see uh, the first one is Nawab Nizam of Bengal, and this happens to be our first public event of this project. There you see Nawab Mansur Ali Khan as a young man. This wonderful color picture uh, was uh, uh, given to us by Lynn. Uh, it is a painting or a picture so now the uh, this is Nawab and his two sons by his Abyssinian wife. They accompanied him to England. And this is a painting by uh, Tissot titled Hush. It features an older and younger Indian prince listening intently while the English all chatter away to one another. Not the Nawab and his son depicting an occasion the Nawab and his older son are frequently reported as attending. And that is a, a caricature uh, that appeared in Vanity Fair in 1870 that we will be talking about to Lynn. And this was the text. Vanity Fair, whenever it projected, profiled any personality, uh, that's what uh, it uh, featured. And sometimes it was liked by people Sometimes there it was controversial. So that is uh, Nawab photographed during his stay in UK. And that is Pim's house, uh, uh, which was rented by him and he stayed there. And this is Alexandra Hotel where Nawab was married to Sarah Vanel. All the story will be unraveled by Lynn today. And this is Nawab Mansur Ali Khan's ancestor Mir Jaffa meeting Robert Clive of the British East India Company. And that's, of course, a painting. And this painting of old Murshidabad showing the famous Hazari 
Hazar Dwari Palace. Hazar Dwari means 1,000 doors in Hindi. And the Imam Bara built by Nawab. This was the Imam Bara built by Nawab uh, Khan. And that's Hazar Dwari Palace, a palace with 1,000 uh, doors. So that, there it is. So I will stop share now. Right, okay. Welcome, Lynn, to the conversation. I thank you very much for making it happen and for coming to our project. So let me start my first question uh, at the very outset that, uh, how do you feel belonging to this great family of Mansur Ali Khan? Well, thank you, Lalit. And, and thank you, John, for your introduction and Lalit for your very kind introduction. I'm delighted to be part of this project and indeed honored to be involved. And it's also wonderful to see all the people here, including my cousins, Miriam and Haida, whom I haven't seen for a very long time. So thank you for that too. Well, the answer is a very complicated one. As I, I grew up in a very remote farm in Australia, and we had very little money so the notion of being connected to the Nawab, this royal family, seemed quite distant, quite unreal, and to some extent it still does. And of course, because of my Scottish father, I don't look what most people think of as Indian, although I think what most people think of as Indian is often very limited. But anyway, um, I also feel delighted in a way to have this connection with India. It expands my life. It gives me a sense of a much larger world. It makes me interested in India and of course in Indian history. So as I say, it's a complicated sense of, of relationship. Brilliant. <laughs> yeah, so, so let's, uh, let's start with the the story and let's start unraveling it uh, as you uh, want to do it. So why did your great grandfather, the Nawab, go to England in 1869 uh, so that all of us can understand that? Right. Well, it's a long story and I'll try not to make it too, too long. <laughs> in the first place, when Mir Jaffa, uh, in some versions, betrayed the country or betrayed the province to the East India Company. He uh, was given a pension, an agreement that he would have a very, very large pension. He would have very large rights, including things which were important to him and his, his descendants, like a 19 gun salute, recognizing his status and the right not to appear in court and so on as other royal families had. Over the years, as each descendant became Nawab, often because they became Nawabs as, as minors, the British gradually reduced the pension saying, well, they were minors, they didn't need this amount. And somehow when they reached their majority, the pension didn't go back to the original amount. So by the time my great grandfather became Nawab at the age of eight years in 1838, he, he, the pension had been reduced to about one tenth of the original amount promised. Furthermore, the British agents who were put in charge of supervising him both as a minor and then when he reached his majority stole quite a lot of the money. There was a particular agent called Torrens who persuaded him to put a large amount of money into an investment in Calcutta. And that investment then went into Mr. Torrens' bank account and never reappeared. It was something like two million, the equivalent of two million pounds at that time, which of course is a great deal more now. And the when Torrens died, the Nawab realized that a great deal of his money had been disappeared, also many of the family jewels. And he 
protested to the British government. He protested to the governor general, who was then Lord Dalhousie. And Dalhousie wasn't interested in making any kinds of concessions or any kind of investigation. So over the, over the years, the Nawab tried to write petitions to make his case for restitution of the money and also of his rights, which had also been diminished for reasons which I can go into, but I won't now. The British government refused, the um, British governor generals refused to forward these petitions. So he finally decided he would go to England himself and petition parliament and try and petition Queen Victoria herself. This was after the, what the British called the mutiny, which the Nawab had supported the British in, not to his credit, I, I add. He um, supplied elephants, he supplied troops, he supplied money, and he assumed that as a result, he would be rewarded, but he wasn't. And he wasn't given any recognition. He was given verbal recognition, but no actual rights and money and so on. So finally, he decided in 1868 that he would go to Britain himself to present his petition. And in 1869, he left, sailed, first of all, to France, where he was received by the Emperor Napoleon III, and arrived in Britain in 1869, April 69, and was presented to Parliament in April uh, 1869. If I can just uh, uh, ask you uh, a supplementary question here, that he was received by Queen Victoria, isn't it? And uh, so, so how was that? Uh, he was given a, a, a very uh, royal welcome, would you say? He was. He was invited to to the palace on on many occasions, in fact, and also by um, the Prince of Wales on many occasions. He was he was seen as 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 royalty. Uh, he was invited to very many aristocratic um, gatherings, and he was he was certainly received as as a royal royalty of the highest uh, status. So how did uh, your uh, uh, great uh, grandfather meet your great grandmother? <laughs> well, he stayed in the Alexandria Hotel, which we saw a picture of, which was one of the most prestigious hotels. The Sultan of Zanzibar stayed there. The Rothschild stayed there. It had large apartments. And incidentally, the Nawab came with a retinue of 12 people, including his cooks, his scripture readers, the musicians, um, the secretaries, and, and so on. So he needed a, a, a good, a large apartment in the hotel where he stayed. And there happened to be working in that hotel, a young 16 year old at the time chambermaid. Her name was Sarah Vanell. And she came from a very poor family in the East End. In fact, the family lived on the street that Charlie Chaplin's family was to uh, lived on. Uh, and uh, so she no doubt was, saw this job she had as a chambermaid as, as quite an achievement in her time. And how they actually met, I don't know. I imagine she might well have been clearing the fireplace in his apartment when he was about to say his early prayers and came across her and they started chatting. That's, that's how I like to imagine it. So it's, it's, like a, it's like a fairy tale story, perhaps. A, and, Cinderella, uh, a Cinderella story, yes. Right. <laughs> so what was the attitude of the British? Uh, because this was uh, uh, the government or the British, they invited him, he came here, but uh, did it not sort of unsettle or, or what kind of attitude did British government take for this uh, marriage? Well, as far as I can tell, the British government was not aware of the marriage until very, very late, until years later. And in fact, as far as I can tell, nobody was aware of it. Sarah was kept out of the picture. She, in the first three or four years, actually lived in a different house with her older sister at one stage and then in another place when her older sister got married. 
So it was only four years later, after she'd already had two children, three children, two children, sorry, that, she, that they actually began to live together, in this case, in a large house in Sussex called Board Hill. Um, and no doubt people then became, became aware, but the British government, I think, was more concerned with the issue of class than race in, in this marriage. As far as I can tell, Sarah remained a Christian. She was a woman of the book at Kitaba. So, so the marriage was acceptable under Shia law. In, in, and so um, it, was, it was only much later when the issue of custody of the children came up that there became to be uh, quite sneering views of her marriage to, to a Muslim and to a prince. Right. Uh, in that case, um, when did Nawab return to India and uh, what happened to his English wife and children? Well, in, in 1879, Sarah discovered that the Nawab had begun an affair with another maid in their house called Julia Lewis. And indeed that the maid was pregnant and she ex was extremely distressed. So she went to her father's house for a while and the children stayed with the Nawab who was now living in Bedford Square. Then she discovered that in fact, the Nawab had taken the children back to India. And this was in 1880, with, uh, along with Julia, the, the, the other maid. And she didn't see the children again for another five years, or the two boys. The Nawab returned in 1881, and Julia joined him in India. They had three children. Uh, and the Nawab died in 1884 in, in India. And at that point, his will decreed that the two, what he called his two English sons, should be sent back to England for their education. And while, while the two girls, altogether there had been six children, two of them died in infancy. Uh, the, the two boys were sent back to England in 1885 with a guardian and the two girls remained in India. Would I, uh, can I please uh, uh, at this stage bring in uh, uh, Mr. Haider Mirza, uh, who has joined us from Karachi. It will be really good to have his uh, take on this whole issue. And of course, uh, Lynn is so happy that she's uh, meeting Haider after maybe many, many years. So well, I... Haiderji, if you can hear us, uh, can you uh, put yourself into the video and unmute yourself and uh, give uh, your uh, take on this whole thing? Uh, can you hear me? Uh, yes, Hadri, we can hear you, but your uh, your uh, video is not on. If you can put on your video, that would be great. Sure, I'm going to try. Yes, you can take your time, no problem. Yeah, that's uh, nice to see you. <laughs> Hello, <Nice>. hi there. <laughs> Hello, hello. hello. Good evening. <laughs> oh, nice Good to evening. meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you too, Catherine. <laughs> and uh, thank you for inviting me to uh, to uh, share my thoughts on this. Uh, it's a it's a pleasure, uh, and you know, it's we are so we feel so proud that our project is not only doing research, producing books and films, but we are making people meet. So <laughs> yeah, it's it's uh, yours. Go ahead. That's very good. Uh, uh, well, my thoughts, uh, uh, it's such a, uh, such a, a tragic affair uh, to see, uh, you know, that the Nawab Tazim was not uh, dealt in a fair manner uh, when he went to petition the British government. Uh, and uh, my thoughts are, uh, you know, that it, it all ended up in a lot of chaotic condition for the family. As you heard from uh, Lynn, she projected the problems very well. Uh, there were financial problems and the Nawab had to go, uh, you know, he had to borrow credit and uh, it was a sordid affair to say the least. And 
uh, disrupted a lot of families in India and also in England. So uh, that's what it is, but uh, you know. Uh, Mr. Uh, Hadarji, th this must have obviously uh, affected, uh, impacted on your family as well. So you obviously chose to go to Pakistan and how it has impacted and how do you reminiscence? Uh, would you like to expand on that? Well, it was a rather grand family, you know, and uh, my cousin Lynn uh, will uh, probably agree. Uh, and uh, so the, the habits of uh, my elders, they had to curtail a lot of, uh, uh, you know, of their habits and, you know, the whole retinue of servants and you know, caretakers and you know all that uh, that just needed to be cut down luckily my grandfather uh, he himself was a decorated uh, man he uh, got the title of khan sahab uh, from george the 6th and then the khan bahadur came he, uh, he was a bureaucrat uh, and uh, he chose to come to pakistan so we came in 47 and uh, uh, he was educated uh, and told my uncles, my father was educated. So we were uh, slightly better off uh, than a lot of people who were not able to get proper education, didn't have any proper facilities. So uh, for that, I'm grateful, uh, I think. I've had quite a privileged life that way. Great. <laughs> Would you like to add anything else so that I can, before I go back to Lynn? Uh, nothing, uh, not, uh, nothing much to add. It's just that it's great to see that people are, you know, are talking about it and uh, you are, uh, you know, talking about it in London. Lynn is there. She's writing a beautiful book, which will be out soon. And I'm really looking forward to that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Hazard Mirza, for joining us. And please stay in the program and enjoy the rest of the conversation. Yes, so, I will. Thank you. Coming back to Lynn. So uh, between, uh, say, 1870 and 1904, uh, 13 Indians were featured in Vanity Fair. You are aware of that. The very first Indian whose caricature write-up appeared on its pages, of course, is uh, Mansoor Ali Khan. So uh, when did you become aware of this and what is your reaction to this? Well, I first became aware when I seriously began, decided to write a book, a biography of, of the, my great grandfather and really of their marriage, of, of the couple. And so when I began researching and now that so many papers and magazines are, are digitalized. It has become much easier to discover things. And you put the name in, in to Google or you put it into the British newspaper archive and various things came up. And one of them was the Vanity Fair article and the image from the Vanity Fair article. So that was about six years ago, perhaps. And um, among many other things that came up, there was a great deal of publicity about the Nawab's presence and his petition in 1870. So this was one of, one of the things. And his, um, the, the caricature, I suppose, uh, surprised me in some ways. And I do know that the Nawab was deeply offended by it and extremely angry when he saw it. And he, his secretary, who was an Englishman called Fox, uh, assured him that in fact, it was an honor to be caricatured and only the most important people managed to get caricatures in Vanity Fair. So whether he was mollified by that, I'm not sure, but he certainly, it is reported that he was very upset by the caricature. Uh, it seems that the Vanity Fair itself uh, uh, took a rather sympathetic view of the Nawab's position. His portrait, I suppose, was captioned a living monument of English injustice. So, so how do you react to that? Well, I think, in fact, most of the newspapers seem to, to be quite sympathetic. And 
certainly the Vanity Fair was one of the most sympathetic in terms of it, but there were lots and lots of pieces in various newspapers. The Irish newspapers were the most sympathetic of all, but lots of the English newspapers too, who felt that the Nawab had been very poorly treated, that there had been an injustice. And, but nevertheless, as the parliament, when the petition came to parliament in 1871, voted not to pursue the petition, not to allow it to be heard. And interestingly, the vote was uh, something like 68 to four and 124 against. The 68 who were four were mostly the Irish politicians. Uh, you have, uh, uh, in our informal meeting at the BFI, British Women's Institute, you had mm -hmm. mentioned about visiting Murshidabad, obviously, and with your uh, great experiences meeting your extended family there. And another thing which I attach to this question is that because of your lineage coming from me, Jafar, did you uh, face uh, any kind of antipathy because, because of the perception or an image of me, Jafar, you know, in Indian history and in the psyche of the people? Well, indeed, most, most of my friends of Indian descent and friends in India do immediately say, oh, Mir Jaffa, he was the man who betrayed us. He was the man who allowed the British in. And I remember I spoke about six years ago at a meeting in, in London. It was run by uh, the Bangladeshi group. And one young man at the end of my talk said, how does it feel to be descended from Mir Jaffa? And, <laughs> <laughs> and of course, you know, I, I can't say that I feel responsible for Mir Jaffa, but nor can I admire him and nor can I uh, pretend that he was a savior of any kind or a messiah of any kind, but at the same time, I suppose I do feel that the history is complicated and certainly Siraj Udwala, whom he betrayed, was by no means a, an ideal Nawab. He was a, almost, I suppose, I would liken him a bit to Caligula. He, he was <laughs> quite, he was quite a, a, a spoiled young man. I think. In fact, isn't it, uh, you feel that sometimes it's very unfair to, to be so judgmental about history, about a different uh, point of time, different period, uh, because uh, it, it's not uh, black and white, isn't it? And that's what uh, Mr. Mirza was also referring to me, that uh, if you see the real story, uh, uh, it is totally different sometimes. Yes, I would agree. I think I... I, I think I, I would never want to say that Mir Jaffa was in any way a hero of any kind. And he was, he was a quizzling. I think we have to admit that. Yeah. But nevertheless, I think probably the story is more complicated, is less simple in terms of betrayers and betrayed than, than many historians would like to make out. And the historians of the time, especially the historian, Indian historians, often uh, give a much more complicated and a much more favorable picture of Mir Jaffa. But then of course, they were writing for his descendants. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Lynn, uh, uh, if you would like, uh, we, we can talk about uh, the, the major book that you are doing and it's coming out in January. And we are so fortunate, uh, the SSCF that you have uh, in a way, uh, agreed that we can make it part of our project, the release of the book. So this whole book will uh, will open up a, a, a family person's view of history. So how have you tackled this subject? Uh, what is the form of this book? Is it autobiography? Uh, how did your uh, you know uh, grandfather went to Australia? So it's it's such a fascinating story. Yes, uh, the, I suppose the book falls into, it, it's really a biography of two families. It's a biography of the Nawab and his English wife, Sarah Vanell, his first English wife, who was of course the, the sixth of his married wives. 
and fourth, in a sense, legal wife. They had three other wives in India living at the time. So, so it, it does, it, I'm afraid, ignore a great deal of the family. It is focused very much on that particular couple and on their children. So my grandfather was Newsret, was the youngest of their children. And he, in 1925, decided to emigrate to Australia because he felt that there was no future for him in England. He felt that he was simply because of his name and title, he was restricted that he, he couldn't work, he couldn't uh, progress, that he, he, was, he was not given the opportunities that he would like to have had to, to lead a worthwhile life. He, interestingly, he did write a bit. He, he published several articles about the attitudes towards Muslims in, in Britain in 1920, he published them in the Daily Mail, which was a very different newspaper at that time from what it is now. So in 1925, he decided, partly because he also wanted his children to grow up, and his wife was, was English, he wanted his children to grow up without the Indian subtitle. He didn't, and they were sent to schools under, under different, as an assumed name. So he changed his name from Nusrat Ali Mirza to Norman Allen Moston. And he persuaded the Australian government, which at that time had a policy, the white Australia immigration policy, which did not normally allow Asiatics. He persuaded them to let him emigrate to Australia with the children. And that he did in 1925. And that's how I come to be an Australian. So, uh, uh, how did you, uh, when did you uh, uh, realize or when did you feel that you should write this book? Because you've been an academic yourself. And how do you reminiscence your uh, childhood in Australia? And uh, how do you knit it all together? Well, when, when I grew up in Australia, because, because my grandfather changed his name partly because the Australian government insisted that he do so, given that they would not normally allow somebody of Asian descent to immigrate there. And because of that, we were not encouraged even to talk about our ancestry. So at this, it was in a way always a kind of mystery, a secret. And at first, I suppose I was very curious about it, but didn't really, my mother, didn't really want to talk about it. I did think of writing a novel, uh, but realized that in fact, I just didn't know enough about the whole context to even write a novel about it. So, and while I was an academic, I was teaching a lot. I was writing a lot of other books on African and Irish literature. And it was only really after I retired 15 years ago that I felt I had the time to really focus on this story. And that's when I seriously began researching it. And the British Library has a huge set of volumes all about the Murshidabad estate, about 12 boxes of papers. Because the, the British government kept a very, very close eye on that family. And there are all kinds of papers, of the finances, the, the political papers and so on. So the research was intense. There was a lot of it, but it was actually quite easy to find a lot of detail. Uh, at this stage, uh, I think I'm curious to bring in uh, Miriam Answorth, who is uh, uh, related to you. Yes, and yes. I would uh, give some relief to you and invite uh, Answorth to come and uh, have her say into this conversation. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me okay, yes? Yes, we do. Um, it's, it's a really strange tale uh, because I uh, and my daughter-in-law have been uh, researching frantically for my family history. And this led us to Lynn because my great-grandfather 
uh, is Sarah Vanell's brother. So obviously from a poor background as well, uh, but it appears that he was actually paid for by the Nawab to go through um, law school. And he actually became a barrister at the Middle Temple in London. So obviously huge rise through the ranks. Um, and a lot of the time, I think he was representing the Nawab over certain things, um, petitioning on his behalf. Then when uh, the Nawab went back to um, Pakistan, as well, back to India, Sarah was left <clears throat> uh, rather penniless, no children, and she had this uh, brother who was then educated in the law. So he then started petitioning on behalf of Sarah and it's just been a fascinating link that Lynn and I and Helen, my daughter-in-law, we met up. We went down to the to Kent to do a bit of uh, rooting around, shall we say. And we met Lynn and that was the start of a, a really lovely uh, friendship as well as finding family. Because I think she discovered things about George that she didn't know. And we discovered things about Sarah. Um, and it's just it's just this one massive, fascinating thing. I mean, there are other strings to my side of the story, but that's not why you're here. Uh, but the fact, what really saddens me, um, we found Sarah's grave. Was it Putney Vale? I think it was, wasn't it, Lynn? Yes, yes. Um, we found Sarah's grave. There was no headstone at all. Mm -hmm. And then we found uh, my great-grandfather's grave, George Vanell and his father's buried there and his sister and there's no headstone on that and that's in the um cemetery next to chelsea football ground can't think of the name of it at the moment and it just seems that it's really sad that there's all this intrigue and, and yet there's nothing nothing left to to mark where anybody's been or anything mm -hmm. like that but it's a, a sad story, but a fascinating story as well. So that's where I come into it. Great. Uh, that's that's very ironical, but uh, so fascinating and so nice that you have tried to dig into that. And what do you feel, Lynn, about what uh, Miriam was saying just now? Yes, I, I think the story of, of Sarah and George is, is, is a sad one, although I was... I, I think Sarah was very, very close to her brother and, and when his death, which was quite an early one in 1895, left her very, very bereft. And um, she, she thereafter lived in, seemed to have had very little relationship with the rest of her family. And I suspect I, whether she disowned them or they disowned her, I don't know, but it's, she, she died when she went, when she died in 1925, there were only six people who were at her funeral, and it was an unspectacular affair. What is uh, the most challenge? What was the most challenging uh, chapter? Uh, what was most challenging for you to do this great book? I think, in fact, the most challenging chapters were the ones on Sarah because. There were lots of material, newspaper reports, photographs, images, uh, papers about the Nawab, and, but almost nothing, of, of course, about Sarah. I found no, no images, no photographs of Sarah at all. I, can't, I don't know what she looked like, except perhaps through looking at pictures of her, of her son, my grandfather. And... Right. They were people who were not regarded as important. <laughs> true, true. Uh, who is uh, publishing this book? Uh, I mean, I give you the, the, the opportunity yes. to uh, plug your book, you know, who, who is the publisher and when is it going to appear and how will it be available to people? Yes, it's, it's going to be published by Westbourne Publications, which is in London. It is scheduled for publication in April. And it's going to be titled The Last Prince of Bengal. 
a family's journey from Indian Palace to the Australian Outback. Wow. <laughs> Great. So I, I just will have uh, hardly one or two questions before I uh, throw it open to uh, some of you who would be able to ask questions. We will be able to take, of course, limited questions. My last question is, uh, has your mixed heritage impacted, uh, you know, positively or negatively on your interaction with people in Britain, in India, in Australia? Well, that again, that's a complicated question. When I when I first began to go to school, which was not till I was age ten, I found that children, the local children, were extremely antagonistic, and they used to sneer at me and ask, "How's the little black princess?" Oh. Which surprised me because I didn't quite see what they meant, <laughs> and it was it took me a while to realize they were actually referring to my grandfather. And Australia at that time was an extremely racist country. It is less so now, much less so, thank God. But so a lot for a long time, I felt una unable to sort of really think about it. It was only when I went to the United States to teach that I began to think much more, I suppose, positively about the ways in which people construct race, the ways in which people think about race, the ways in which color is a totally metaphorical notion, really. <laughs> and, and, um, and it was really only when I came to Britain to teach that I began to be able to think much, much more about Indian history, about my various relationship with India and Indian history, and indeed to become very, very interested in it and begin to visit India and make many, many friends whom I cherish in, in India. And, and what has been uh, your interaction and your relationships with uh, Indians and your relatives in India? Well, I've met, uh, I met some when I went to Murshidabad and, and I was treated with great generosity and, and enthusiasm, in fact, and I was so delighted. The, the um, descendant of the, of the uh, Nawab of Murshidabad, who was the son of, the, the son of, of, the, of the Nawab who, who succeeded him, um, his, his descendant greeted me and invited me to his home and showed me photographs. And on my second visit, uh, another descendant invited me to her home and showed me a wonderful genealogy written in Urdu, which I'd been studying. And uh, the uh, reception was, was very friendly and very warm, and that was very heartening. And, and I've also been delighted to make contact with Haida Mirza and some other relatives both in Britain and, and, and so on. I should say that another relative, um, Humayun Mirza, who is the son of, of Iskander Mirza, who was the first president of Pakistan, um, was rather more suspicious of, of my family and I think feared that we were going to try and claim some rights that he, or, uh, that he didn't feel we, we deserved. In Indian uh, museums and, uh, you know, in Murshidabad or elsewhere, uh, in, in libraries, do you find enough material uh, on, your, on your history, on your ancestors? Well, in, in the British Library, there's, there's certainly plenty. Um, Murshidabad Palace has, has a great deal of material, which I really haven't been able to investigate as much as I like. The, the palace is now a state museum and is extremely popular, is visited by hundreds and hundreds of people every day in, in Mashidaba, not by European tourists, but by tourists from India itself. It has been fascinating to talk to you, Lynn. Uh, I would like to end with the last question. Uh, I'm very curious to know of your family, your immediate family. I, I know your husband is, is a very well-known person. Would you like to tell something about your husband and your uh, daughters? Uh, and on what they're doing at the moment? Yes. Well, my husband, Martin, is, is Martin Schofield, 
is is also an academic and a teacher of English literature and has written books on T.S. Eliot and Shakespeare and the American short story. And um, I have two daughters, we have two daughters. My older daughter, Robin is a midwife and a nurse and is struggling to cope with COVID patients. And I think she's just wonderful and amazing. And my younger daughter, Rachel, is also somebody who cares for people and lives closer to me. And um, I'm just very proud of both my daughters. Brilliant. It's, it has been really fascinating mm -hmm. to talk to you. It was lovely. And uh, now I throw it open to others to ask questions. And I have already got uh, uh, two questions, one from Alka of our SSC of Volunteer and one from Kusum. And I can see uh, John noting down something. Another uh, very uh, uh, very valuable uh, volunteer, Sushma Sabni, has asked something. So I'll take it later. But first, can I start with Alka, please? Alka, can you unmute yourself and ask one question? Yes. Just one question allowed. Sure. <laughs> I have so many questions, but first of all, thank you, Lynn, uh, <laughs> for talking so far. Uh, it has been like really interesting to know. Uh, my question would be like, uh, because of your background, uh, do you feel equally connected to uh, Australia, India, Pakistan, and England? Um. I, I suppose I still feel basically that I, I am an Australian. That's where I grew up. I left when I was 23, but I think one's childhood always defines where you feel your basic identity is. And my brothers and sisters are all in Australia. So, so I feel that, but I do, I do very much welcome the sense of also having an Indian and a Pakistani uh, identity. And, and th those are complicated. They sometimes cross each other. Uh, I don't feel particularly English, even though my mother was English. And I don't feel particularly Scottish, even though my father was Scottish. So th it's interesting the ways in which one's identity tends to take on different aspects, depending on what happens to you as a child, I think. Yeah, that's fair enough. Like, <laughs> <laughs> great. So uh, I, I I will have to stop you, <laughs> Alka. I know you are tempted to ask other questions, <laughs> so I have to give this chance to Kusum if uh, she is ready with her question. It's really nice to hear so much from you, and uh, from your other uh, from Miriam as well as from Mirza mm -hmm. Sahar. Uh, I just uh, wanted to ask you about uh, you know the. Um, Mansur Ali Khan's family is supposed to have been of foreign origin, uh, Muslims who invaded India. Uh, so can you throw some light on the ancestry of, of the family? Where did they go back, their roots? Well, uh, Mir Jaffa originally came from Iraq. And that's about all, that's all, about all I know. Yeah. I know. I know that uh, some, so I think Haida Mirza probably can fill, fill us in better than I can. Can I uh, add a few words? Yeah, Mr. Mr. Haider uh, Mirza, you can answer that, you can uh, respond and uh, put your video so, on. Uh, <clears throat> Mir Jafar's uh, uh, grandfather was married to uh, the Emperor Aurangzeb's uh, niece. Uh, it is said that he was married to, in fact, Dara Shiko's, one of Dara Shiko's daughters. And uh, <clears throat> the family migrated from Iraq and Yemen uh, uh, during Aurangzeb's time. Uh, and uh, Aurangzeb, uh, to welcome them, uh, he left the capital uh, and they say four coasts the distance he traveled to receive our ancestor. Uh, so that was a great honor. Uh, he traveled, greeted, and then, uh, then there was this marriage contract. After, uh, afterwards, they were given uh, uh, you know, uh, duties. Uh, they became a part of court, of the imperial court, 
uh, they were the Lord's steward. They were first given the Lord's steward, and then uh, these people were sent to far off uh, provinces uh, to serve over there. So they had an imperial mansab, as they say. Lynn, if you could please translate the word mansab, what would that be? I think I, I, I've forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot. It's rank, probably. <laughs> mansab yeah, mansab is, is rank. Yeah. yeah right, yes. Rank. Mm. So I think uh, they probably rose up to more than probably 5,000 savars mm -hmm. and 5,000 mm -hmm. savars, yes. Probably more than that. Mm. Thank you. So uh, yeah. High, uh, Mughal, uh, uh, hierarchy. A great. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Haider Mirza from Karachi. So uh, uh, I think uh, Kusum, is your answer complete, or uh, shall I go for the next question? You can fine, unmute yourself. Fine. Yeah, I got I got the hang of it that it was he was part of the Mansabdar, so the Mansabdari system of the Mughals. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. Right, and uh, John, uh, uh, the family is a Sayyid family. So uh, they were uh, in Arabia. They uh, were uh, looking after the mausoleum of the fourth Caliph of Islam, as Hazrat Ali. So they were placed there. They were the uh, mutawalli of that place, that sacred place for Muslims. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I think I can take the next question from our uh, um, uh, uh, volunteer, Dr. Sushma Sabnis, I think who uh, has asked, does anyone know why these famous or prominent personalities were caricatured? Uh, why these personalities were caricatured? Who was the artist? artist? I think Kusum is uh, in a better position to answer that question because she is the main chief researcher. Uh, I'm ha happy to take that question, uh, Dr. Sabnis. Thank you for your wonderful contribution. Yeah, Dr. Sabnis is uh, an artist, apart from being a retired GP, uh, and she has done some beautiful uh, portraits for us for our project. Uh, she, uh, her question is about who were the artists for the Vanity Fair. There, there were a number of artists who contributed uh, their caricatures and art pieces to the Vanity Fair over the years. Uh, some of the top names were uh, Emil Adam, who was a German, there was Carlo Pellegrini uh, and Max Beerbohm, who was an essayist and, as well as a cartoonist. And uh, one of the most uh, important of the caricaturists was, of course, Leslie Matthew Wall, whom I had mentioned earlier. And he used to uh, write under the, uh, draw under the pseudonym of Spy. So sometimes people have said, oh, was he a spy? So no, it, he wasn't a spy. He just had this uh, pseudonym of Spy. And he also left a wonderful biography of, of his called uh, 40 Years of Spy, in which uh, he has mentioned a number of people whom he drew caricatures of, uh, such as uh, for, for our project, uh, he, we, we found that he makes references to um, the Prime Minister of Hyderabad State, Salar Jung, when he was here. Uh, he, had that, he had some sittings with him and also some African uh, celebrities who were here. He has uh, written a few lines about each of uh, some of these personalities whom we have included in our project. And the other question uh, of uh, uh, Sushma ji was the, why were these people included? Well, I think basically they were included because they were in the news, they were, they were very important people, they were rulers of important states, they were visiting for some uh, important occasion here or for some of their own work like the Nawab um, Mansoor Ali Khan was here for his his pension, so they heard about him and he was featured. And I think the Nawab was also interested in putting forward his his case before the British public and the government. And so uh, he he was uh, they made some he made some special efforts to get included through some of his people whom he knew. And many of the others in our project were uh, important people like Prime Minister Salar Jung of Hyderabad who was very well known to the British, having served the British uh, during the revolt of 1857 and 58. And um, then other people were chosen because they were important sports personalities, such as Ranji, uh, who was a cricketer, who was also a prince, of course. And uh, then there were cer certain people who were generals, uh, such as uh, 
uh, an important uh, African personality in our project uh, from Ethiopia um, that was earlier Abyssinia uh, was uh, chosen because he was a very well-known army officer and uh, very well connected to the ruler of Ethiopia. And um, some uh, one of the characters in our uh, project is, of course, a barrister, which is a bit unusual because although there were several other barristers who could have been included, such as Dada Bhai Noroji, for instance, was here and he had even become an MP. Uh, and he was the first Asian MP to be elected, but he wasn't included for some reason. And so the, it's a really question of selective inclusion. That's why we've called our project selective inclusion, because uh, the, uh, it seemed to be quite, they seemed to be quite selective in including an ex, there was also selective exclusion because while the many princes and rulers were included, many uh, important people who could have been included, such as say Rabindranath Tagore, who was here, but even received the Nobel prize, he wasn't included. Uh, Inayat Khan, who was a great Sufi musician and a preacher about Sufism was here, but he was not included. He was very much in the news also, if you, you see him covered in newspapers. And similarly, no woman was ever included from Asia or Africa. So there were these interesting exclusions also. So I hope I have answered your question, Sushma Ji. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope Sushma Ji is happy about the answer. And thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Kusum, uh, for that enlightened answer. So Sushma Ji, you are happy, are you? <laughs> yes, yes, I am. I am. Yeah. Thank you very much for thank asking you. this uh, searching question. And I would like to, before I give it to uh, back to Johnny, for his final word of thanks. I would give uh, one more opportunity to anyone who wants to ask a question. Uh, I can see uh, many of our friends. Oh, there's one from Texas, our friend, Jayshree. Yeah, Jayshree, can you unmute yourself and ask a question? Hello, Professor Eanes. Uh, it's, it's an honor to be uh, in Zoom meeting with you. Uh, have heard a lot of good things and uh, about you and your ancestry. Uh, I just had a simple question. Um, coming from such a rich heritage, culturally rich heritage, how has that helped you as a person in your life? Well, th thank you for that question. I, I think, I suppose, I, I think it has, first of all, enlarged my sense of where I might belong, which is internationally rather than just one little place. Mm -hmm. either one little island, one big island, Australia, or one little island, England. But it is also, it is also very fundamental to my whole career, where I have been so interested in the whole notion of identities and how identities, I think, need to be much more fluid and much more complex than many people want to make them. So that I, I do think that my career as studying post-colonial literatures and writing about African, Irish, uh, Asian uh, writers is, is very much, has very much stemmed from that sense of my own identity as belonging to several places rather than just one. Thank you so much. You have a very unique background and it's, it's a pleasure to be in touch with you because you know, you, uh, you, have given the society so much be just because of uh, coming from such a mix of culturally rich background. So uh, thank you so much for answering thank my question. Thank you. Thank you, Jeshi, for asking that question. So that brings us to the end of the uh, end of the show. And I would like to uh, say that I thank again all our friends from London, from USA, from India. I would especially like to mention Zair Banu Gifford, who is also here, uh, who is also going to uh, talk to us about this project. So Zair Banu, thank you very much for being here, although I can't see your face. <laughs> and uh, also thank so many other people from India and friends of um, uh, Lynn and her relatives, especially from Karachi, Haider uh, Mirza, uh, thank you very much. So I will now hand it over to John for his final word of thanks. Well, thank you very much, Lynn. Uh, I, I must say that um, it's been a, a, a very rich and rewarding session. And for me personally too, actually, because I began, I've been working on this issue of the complexity of identity 
for about 50 years now, starting first in Calcutta in 1970-71, uh, where I was looking at uh, Bengali Muslim middle class identity and how these identities are put together in various contexts. So um, thank you very much indeed. And um, also I thought what was so interesting was um, the point you made about mixture or, or hybridity, you know, and the way that this is uh, often um, dominated by notions of purity, group purity, whether it's racial purity or national purity. So uh, I think that's a, a long struggle that we're both involved with uh, others, you know, against this notion of national pure identity, which is at the heart of a lot of um, very punitive um, um, notions of belonging. So thank you very much for that. Um, and also personally, uh, I've also gone on a similar journey because um, my grandfather's French, um, but I was adopted and this became a kind of great family secret. So your um, uh, researching your past and, and turning up these secrets is something that of course, uh, I personally find fascinating and I'm sure lots of other people here have also felt the same way. So these are kinds of universal issues, aren't they, that uh, you, uh, you are addressing in, in your own particular way. So th thank you very much. So it's more of a personal uh, reflection and, and vote of thanks, but I'm sure I'm reflecting what everyone else is feeling as well. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.